Now, before I begin, I just want to make a couple uh, acknowledgments. Um, this, the work that I want to share uh, with you today, you know, I, I'm interested in quite a few different aspects of, of fish biology. And as John said, I, I study a little critter called the three spine stickleback, which is a really fun word to say. I have uh, three, three kids um, aged four, six, and seven, and they love saying three spine stickleback. Uh, it's, uh, I get a lot of nickelback jokes from the work that I do. Uh, I should have worn my shirt today. Actually, I have a uh, Nickelback cover album, but all the Nickelback people are replaced with Stickleback heads. And one of my students made that for me. Uh, but I want to acknowledge that uh, the work I'm going to share with you today is not work that I uh, had to go out into the field to do directly. Uh, the field in this case was restaurants. It was kind of fun. I got to go out with my family and you know sample some sushi. And that was the hard field work that we did. Uh, but it wasn't just me doing this work. Uh, this was largely work done by undergraduate biology students um, from three different institutions here in Calgary, Mount Royal University under the supervision of Dr. John Mee, uh, the University of Calgary under the supervision of Dr. Sean Rogers, and then at Ambrose University under uh, my supervision. Um, and a lot of this work was funded by the Internationalization at Home uh, in Science Education grant. So just wanted to get those acknowledgements out of the way. And again, you can find me, because I see the recording just started, you can find me here on Twitter at Matthew RJ Morris, uh, where I tweet a little fish of the day, and uh, you can go to my website. Now, I don't know if, if you're like me, if you like going to restaurants, I, I do, although I you know, uh, haven't gone to nearly as many restaurants over the last couple of years as I used to. Um, one of my favorite foods is a, uh, a, a hot beef sandwich. And just you go in there, you order that beef, you know exactly what you're going to get, that good Alberta farm-raised cattle, right? But what if, you know, you ordered that beef, you, you don't see the cow, you don't hear it mooing, right? There, there aren't really the features that would tell you that this is in fact beef, other than sort of the, rel the, the general appearance of the meat. But what if you were to find out that that cow you ate was actually this adorable little panda bear? You had just been duped. Right? What you thought you ate uh, was actually something completely different. How would you feel? When it comes to mammals, we get a, an awful lot of outrage when things like this happen. And there have been reports, not of panda bears in Canada, uh, but certainly of horse meat ending up in the grocery store. But you don't know that it's horse, horse meat. Uh, consumers eat it thinking it's ground beef, uh, but in fact, it's ground horse. And the only way to know that is to do things like DNA testing. Now you go to the grocery store or you go to the restaurant and you order fish and chips. This is a very different uh, sort of food. Now you don't go to the restaurant and order a mammal sandwich, right? Or a bird salad. You wanna know exactly what type of mammal or what type of bird you're consuming. You, you order beef or you order chicken or you order bison. But when it comes to fish, we have a, a bit of a different relationship with our food here in Canada. We, we can just use this term fish, just throw that out there. Um, not realizing that we could be getting any of potentially 30 some thousand uh, different species of vertebrate that fall under this category of fish. Now, obviously we don't sell all 38,000 species of fish here in Canada, but we do uh, sell over a thousand species of fish in Canada. What kind of fish are you eating when you order fish and chips? Are these fish healthy for you? Are they good for you? Do they have some sort of conservation concern? No, there are fish you can buy here in Canada that are as endangered as that panda bear, perhaps even more so. And you can purchase them legally in Canada. You can buy uh, bluefin tuna. Uh, there's a couple different species of bluefin tuna, and many of them are not doing well. But you can buy that completely legally. However, you might be an informed uh, citizen and you wish to make the best possible choice. So you're not going to order fish and chips. You're going to order you know, Pacific cod and chips knowing full well that Pacific cod is, it's considered secure uh, internationally. It's a fine fish to eat. But are you actually eating Pacific cod or did you get something else? Right? When you go to the market or you go to the sushi store, you go to the restaurant, you're given typically just a small portion of the fish and it has lost all of its identifying features. Right? You don't, um, well, you may not buy, you know, a head-on fish. You can buy those certainly at, at Superstore, and that's in fact become a little more common over the last few years. You may have noticed uh, an increase in head-on fish, um, specifically because you know having heads on the fish lets you identify the uh, 
the creature that you're eating. But if you just get this small little bit of flesh, here we have some kind of pinkish flesh, probably a salmon, you might think, right? There we have a sort of whitish flesh on sushi. That context would tell you maybe this is like a, a bit of tuna. And then you get like a small fillet here. So maybe that's some sort of cod or something like that. Right, but the main distinguishing features, the actual morphology of the fish, it's gone, it's stripped away. It's possible that you've been duped. And in fact, all of these cases were cases of fish fraud, where what you bought is not what you got. So here this was sold as salmon sushi, uh, in particular Atlantic salmon sushi, and it turned out to be rainbow trout. Rainbow trout that was pink, because its diet had been manipulated in a, in a farm setting to mimic the color of Atlantic salmon. Or this tuna, it turned out to be escalar. And we'll talk more about escalar uh, in a little bit because escalar is considered the ex lax of the sea. So hopefully this wasn't an all-you-can-eat uh, buffet or you're in some trouble. And this Pacific cod was actually Atlantic cod. If you know much about Canada's fisheries uh, and the history of Canada's fisheries, you know that the Atlantic cod fishery collapsed in the 90s and uh, was economically devastating to the, the, uh, the Maritimes. Um, the Atlantic cod are not doing very well. So you might have tried to make the ethically informed decision of purchasing Pacific cod. And in fact, you ate something that was uh, you know, of conservation concern without realizing it. Now, all of this is exacerbated by a complex relationship that we have between the things we eat and the names we give those things. So bear with me for a moment because I'm gonna take you down a bit of a rabbit hole on naming conventions when it comes to fish. But first, um, I just wanna make sure that everything's good. You guys can hear me okay? And you can still see the screen okay? Uh, yeah, I can hear you and I can see the screen well. Awesome, thank you so much. And if anybody has questions while I'm talking, um, feel free to type it in the chat and uh, uh, I'll eventually notice it. You know, I've done uh, several years of teaching over Zoom now. I'm getting a little bit proficient at it, although I still tend to forget certain things. Yeah, when it comes to naming fish, we have sort of regionally specific terms for different types of fish, right? Which of these is pickerel? That's gonna depend on where in Canada you grew up. Right, uh, how you answer that question. If you're like me and grew up in Southern Ontario, this fish on the right would be what you'd identify as a pickerel. This is a chain pickerel. It's related to uh, Northern Pike. But if you grew up here in Alberta, this fish on the left, what I would have called a walleye, is something you uh, would have called a pickerel. So if you go to a market in Calgary and you're from Alberta and you see pickerel for sale, you're gonna assume that it is this creature on the left, but if you're from Ontario and you're walking through our market and you see a pickerel for sale, you might assume it's this creature on the right. So we have these regionally specific names for fish, uh, but we also have scientific names for fish. Uh, scientists, while starting back with Linnaeus in the 1700s, um, wanted to standardize how we named living creatures. They wanted to uh, make it so that researchers from different locations uh, around the world could have a common tongue to talk about the same creature, know what they were talking about, right? So you don't have a researcher from Ontario and a researcher from Alberta, both eagerly sharing their data over pickerel to discover to their dismay that they're actually talking about completely different fish species, right? So we have these scientific names for things. Uh, just one problem, uh, the scientific names constantly change, or at least there isn't much stability to scientific names. So just maybe this is an extreme case in point. This is a rainbow trout that I'm showing you here. It, it goes by the scientific name Oncorhynchus mycus. And that uh, name goes all the way back to 1792 when it was named Selmo mycus. This little table on the right, all of these things that you see here, these are all scientific names that have been applied to the rainbow trout at one point in time. So Selmo truncata, Selmo, uh, Eridia, Samuel Gardneri, all of these are scientific names that were supposed to be the standardized thing that just says rainbow trout, but actually it's gone through um, a lot of change uh, over the years. And that can add some complexity to naming conventions if two different scientists are using, one's using an out-of-date scientific name and the other is using the most up-to-date scientific name. 
Okay, so we have the, this complexity in regionally specific names, but also in scientific names. And then we have life history names for fish. Uh, these are all rainbow trout, but this top little tiny individual, we call this a par. It has these little tiny marks on the side. Those are called par marks, and it identifies this as a, as a uh, young rainbow trout. But then it starts to lose those par marks. It starts to undergo some physiological changes. At that point, we call it a smolt. And then the adult, we might give it different names depending on where it goes for the winter. If it goes out to sea, we'll call it a steelhead, right? But if it, if it never touches the ocean, we might call it a rainbow trout. So we have these different names just for one species of fish. And then think about the food we eat. We have so many different names for the food we eat, let alone for the species behind them. We have bacon and ham and pork chops and all these different terms that we all know refer to fish, or to pigs rather, excuse me. Uh, but for fish too, there can be multiple names. If, if you grew up in the Maritimes, you might have eat, uh, consumed baked scrod, you might have had salt fish, you might have had fish sticks. All of those are uh, food names, specific uh, ways of treating Atlantic cod. So they all refer to the same thing. Uh, the same species, Atlantic cod, but three completely different names depending on how the food is prepared. Then there are uh, other sorts of foods like sushi that can have their own complex names, unagi for instance, uh, typically is a, a freshwater eel, um, often a Japanese eel or an American eel. If you have ahi tuna, you know that that's likely yellowfin tuna. Traditionally that's what that is meant. So we have these uh, so the English food naming conventions, and then we also have other cultures that have their own naming conventions, some of which have been adopted uh, here in Canada. And then there's things like imitation crab that yeah, are made out of fish, but uh, you might not see anywhere on the packaging what type of fish is making up that imitation crab. It's typically this guy on the right, walleye pollock, but it could also be a species of whiting. Um, so we have all these different names, scientific, food, cultural uh, names for creatures. And all of them are on the table for marketing. If you wanna sell your fish product, you might want to give it a regionally specific name. You might want to advertise its science name. You might want to advertise a particular cultural name. All of those are on the table. And then marketers could potentially make up their own names as well, right? There's these ugly fish called angler fish. Nobody wants to eat an angler fish. So we'll market them as monkfish. Uh, and then people won't have that association in their mind of that disgusting little angler fish. So the market name, when you go into the grocery store, or you go into the restaurant and you look at the menu or you look at the label on the package, the market name is the thing that you're seeing. But what on earth is behind that market name? You have, uh, there, there, there's so many different different things going into naming, it might be difficult for you as the consumer to know what you're supposed to be eating, let alone what you're actually eating, right? There could be one species that could go by a variety of names, or there could be many species that all go by the same name. So when that's the case, how do you know what you're eating? Well, here in Canada, uh, the names of fish products are regulated by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. They maintain something called the fish list, and that fish list uh, lays out all legally permissible product names. And if this works, I'm going to just show you an example of the fish list. Hopefully, you can see me scrolling up and down right now. Yeah, it's working. Yeah, it's working. Awesome. So what I did was I went to the fish list, and I just typed in salmon just to see what sort of things... Um, have Oh, and you know what? I just realized I gave away an answer to a, a future question on salmon. Let, I'm not going to do salmon. I'm going to go back and let's do cod. That way I don't give away an answer. And I just type in cod and submit. And so all the things that have cod somewhere in their name come up. So you'll see we have a scientific name. You can legally sell this creature under that scientific name. It also has an English name, black cod. So you could sell it under that name. And these names have to be associated with one another. So if you sell something as black cod, it has to be this particular species. Uh, an Oplopoma fimbria. That's what black cod has to refer to. And as you scroll down, you might see something like, here we have Gaddis morua showing up a couple times on this list. It can be sold as Atlantic cod, or it could be sold as cod. 
If we go down a little bit further, we have something called Greenland Cod. And you'll note it can be sold as Greenland Cod or as Ogak. It cannot be sold as Cod. So we have one Cod that can be sold as Cod, but another Cod that cannot be sold as Cod. It can only be sold as Greenland Cod or Ogak. Okay, so the Canadian Food Inspection Agency fish list is designed to um, provide some simplicity to the naming process so that you as a consumer uh, can know exactly what sort of species you're getting or hopefully will know what, um, what kind of fish you're eating. So on that fish list, there are 1,940 unique entries. 1,054 of those are at the species or genus level. So there are 1,054 unique fish species that can be sold in Canada. And there are 1,226 unique English names because multiple species can go by multiple names. On that list, a single species can have between one to seven English names uh, under which it can be legally sold, right? So seven different names for some of these fish, uh, any one of which is completely acceptable for selling that particular species, an average of 1.8 names per species. But a single English name could be applied to anywhere from one to 42 species, depending on the English name. So, uh, and by species, there's little asterisks here because sometimes they don't identify the species on the fish list. They take it to what's called the genus level and a single genus could have multiple species within it. So something like rockfish is a totally acceptable name. Uh, it can be sold on the market as rockfish, but it applies to a lot of different species. Red snapper is a totally acceptable name, but it applies to two unique species that are in completely different genera. So just to sort of hopefully make this point, both of the fish you see on this screen can be legally sold as cod in Canada, but the one on the left can also be sold under the name Atlantic cod. The one on the right could also be sold as Pacific cod, but you can't mix those two up. So you could sell them both as cod, but you couldn't call both of them Atlantic cod or both of them Pacific cod, right? So if you see something called cod, it's one of these two species, you don't know which one you're eating. If it's called Atlantic cod, you better be eating the creature on the left. If it's called Pacific cod, you better be eating the species on the right. Otherwise, it's illegal. What's interesting is that these creatures have different conservation statuses. So if you bought something called cod, you will have no idea whether you're eating something that has a national conservation status of imperiled or eating something that has a national conservation status of secure. So again, if you buy a specific cod, you can be fairly confident you're eating something that's secure. If you're eating Atlantic cod, you can be fairly confident you're eating something that is imperiled. Similarly, on the Canadian Food Inspection Agency fish list, the word tuna can legally be used to refer to any of 14 different species of fish. So if you're eating tuna, you have no idea what species of tuna you're eating. And in Canada, it is completely legal for you to be eating southern bluefin tuna, which has an IUCN, so that's the International Union on the Conservation of Nature. Uh, uh, it has a red list status of critically endangered. Now the government of Canada doesn't recognize that because it's not a Canadian fish. But internationally, it has this conservation status of being critically endangered and you can absolutely eat it when you buy something called tuna. But you could also be eating yellowfin tuna that is of least concern. So you have no idea when you buy something called tuna exactly what you're getting. So here's where I had to change my example because I had a question here. Which of these could be sold as salmon? Here you're seeing a couple different uh, species. You got some rainbow trout down here. You got an Atlantic salmon up here. You have two different species of Pacific salmon here. Which of these could be sold legally in Canada under the name salmon? Now you might think it's all of them. You might think it's the Atlantic salmon and the Pacific salmon, but you'd be wrong. This is a really weird case. The only fish in Canada that can legally be sold under the word salmon without any qualifier is Atlantic salmon. So whenever you're buying salmon sushi, it has to be Atlantic salmon or it is not legal. So in uh, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency fish list, there is what uh, we could refer to as legally ambiguous naming uh, ingrained in, into the law. Rockfish could be any of 109 different species of fish. You have no idea what you're eating when you eat rockfish, but that's perfectly legal. 
Rose fish could be any of 11, Pacific snapper could be any of 13, and on and on we go with this legal ambiguity. Whereas other species, uh, legally, uh, are very specific. Greenland cod uh, has to be Gaddis ogak. There's no other fish called Greenland cod. You know exactly what species you're getting uh, when you eat Greenland cod, or so you think. Because here, here comes the big question, is what you bought actually what you got? That is, after you've gone through all this rigmarole of all the legalities of naming, so you've chosen something called uh, yellowfin tuna because you don't eat tuna. That could be any of 14 different species with different conservation statuses. So you chose yellowfin tuna. Did you actually get yellowfin tuna? It doesn't have any of the identifying features. How on earth do you know that you actually got yellowfin tuna and not something else? Is what you bought actually what you got? So this is what uh, my students did uh, at Ambrose and at UFC and at Mount Royal. Um, they participated in something called DNA barcoding. They went out, they, they put on their little detective hats, they sampled fish from various markets, they took pictures of the fish, they took pictures of the label. This is one of the samples right here. You see it's called Cod Filet Pacific Fresh, which is already a nightmare in, in terms of legal naming conventions that should be Pacific Cod, not Cod separate word Pacific over on the side. But at any rate, um, they took photos. We have the sort of the trail of evidence. Um, we have the receipts, we have the menu uh, images, all that sort of stuff. And then they took out a bit of tissue and they put it in a preservative and we sent it off to the University of Guelph who pioneered this DNA barcoding technology. This is a, a homegrown Canadian invention. What they do is they sequence a region of DNA it's, if you're interested, it's a, it's a gene called cytochrome C oxidase one that's involved in the electron transport chain. So it's in your mitochondria. Um, but this particular gene is, is species specific typically. What that means is that you can use it essentially as you would use um, a barcode at a grocery store, right? The barcode on, on the can of Chunky Campbell soup is different from the barcode on uh, the Purina dog chow, right? Those are different barcodes that connect to different things. It's the same with the sequence of DNA. You can use the sequence of DNA to identify um, the tissue to species. So we're really interested in using this technology to see if uh, what's on the label, this market name, does that match with the identity found using DNA barcoding? This is what a typical DNA barcode might look like. It's just a series of C's, T's, A's, and G's, the letters of DNA. It can be variable in length, but anywhere from uh, you know, 300 to 650 nucleotides long, uh, give or take. What we do with this is we put it into a database. So here's the total process, and here's where all these names come in. We have in the, in the top here is our market name, Pacific Cod. We go to the CFIA fish list, and we see, okay, Pacific Cod can refer to one and only one species of fish under this Latin name, the science name, Gaddis macrocephalus. And then we take our DNA barcode and we put it into a database that just stores DNA barcodes and uh, connects those barcodes with the species. And what we get when we put in that particular barcode that I showed you is this species, Gaddis morua. This is not Gaddis macrocephalus. This is not the Pacific cod. We've been duped. We've been had. We were eating Atlantic cod, but it was sold as Pacific cod. And so our, our undergrads were acting as citizen scientists, as, as detectives, and you know, we, we've collected this data now since 2016. Um, we actually have a little bit of data from 2014, and then from 2016 to 2020, we've been uh, every fall in the genetics class going out and sampling these fish. So we've built up a, a fairly decent um, database. Now, just to give you a sense of expectations, Oceana Canada has been running this data uh, for a variety of cities across Canada. They found what they call a mislabeling rate of 59% in Toronto, a mislabeling rate of 38% in Halifax. That means 59% uh, of fish in Toronto have a DNA barcode that is different from the market name. It's different from what's acceptable under the fish list. They don't match. So they call that mislabeling. So we're really curious, how does Calgary compare to those stats? So here's our sample size. We have, um, uh, it was just one class, one year's class at Mount Royal, so 10 samples from them. We have two different classes from U of C, 46 samples, and then 256 samples collected by students from Ambrose for a total of 312 samples. 
uh, from around Calgary. Now this is just for fish products. I have another 150 or so, and I think I'm getting another large chunk uh, in the very near future of invertebrates, shrimp and uh, uh, clams and uh, uh, octopus and the like. Okay, um, of those 312 samples, there is about an even split between grocery store samples, um, including places like Walmart, Sobeys, Superstore, uh, Costco, Co-op, and what I'm calling Japanese-styled restaurants. These are uh, your sushi vendors. Um, like uh, We had also um, a couple, I guess what you call American or British-styled restaurants, like pubs, British pubs, right, that sell fish and chips and those sorts of things. We didn't have a ton of that because that's expensive. Students typically steered towards the cheaper stuff or the stuff mom and dad was buying at the grocery store. Um, and then we had nine samples from seafood markets. Um, so places like Pelican Pier, that sort of, sort of place. So now the moment you've all been waiting for, I took you down this sort of rabbit hole of legal conventions for naming practices in Canada. What did we actually find? Here's what we had. 33% of Calgary based samples were mislabeled. Now that's collectively over all the years. Like 208 were not, 104 were. So about one in every three fish that we collected was not abiding by Canadian Food Inspection Agency labeling practices. What you bought was not what you got. But it's a little more complicated than that. You know, this is the sort of big sound bite. This is what um, the conservation groups really like to show because then it gets people really riled up and uh, uh, wanting to, to do something. But when you actually look at that data in a little bit more detail, there's some, some interesting things going on here. You know, 162 of the samples were clearly unambiguously not mislabeled. They were completely exactly what uh, you would have expected. An additional 46 of them were likely not mislabeled. What this means is that there is something called Pacific halibut. And we got the DNA barcode back and the DNA barcode was a little bit ambiguous. It couldn't tell whether it was Pacific or Atlantic halibut. And that's the case for certain species of fish. Tuna are pretty notorious for this. Um, the DNA barcode doesn't give great resolution for species that are very closely related to one another like Pacific and Atlantic halibut. And so what this means is that the DNA barcode couldn't rule out mislabeling, uh, but nor could it rule out that it wasn't mislabeled, right? The, the actual fish showed up in that DNA barcode, but so did another species. So um, for all intents and purposes, we would say, you know, if the null hypothesis uh, is that uh, they are not mislabeled, we cannot reject the null hypothesis for those 46 samples. Then 67 of them were clearly and unambiguously mismatched, clearly illegal. But 35 of them were in this weird zone of like, I don't know, the name was a little strange. The name wasn't necessarily legal, but you as the person buying that fish, you knew what you were getting with that name and you got what you expected. So I'm going to unpack that a little bit more. And then finally, it was kind of interesting. There were two fish that uh, the DNA barcode couldn't find a match in the database. They just couldn't figure out what fish it was looking at. Um, and it's not because the DNA barcode is relatively short. It was just sampling something that seemed to be unique. So we weren't quite sure what to do with that. But let's look at the unambiguous mislabeling, the stuff that was so clearly uh, mislabeled. 13 out of 14 red snapper products, things labeled as red snapper, um, typically in sushi form, were actually tilapia. Now there are two species that can be called red snapper, um, Sebastius rubarimus down here and uh, Lejanus campicanus. And forgive me if I'm butchering these Latin names, I've done this work for over a decade and I'm still real bad with my Latin. Uh, so the rule is say it with confidence and no one will know. Uh, and in fact, it will cause them to question their longstanding pronunciations of these terms. So that, that's the rule. At any rate, People in Calgary bought these things. These are marine wild caught fish, relatively expensive. And what they actually got was a farmed freshwater cheap fish, 13 out of 14 times. That 14th time also wasn't red snapper. It was a different species of snapper, but not either of the two shown here. So that means 100% of red snapper that we sampled in the city, 100% of it was mislabeled. Nobody in the city that we could find was actually eating red snapper when they bought red snapper. 
39% of things called salmon were mislabeled. And remember, salmon can only legally refer to Atlantic salmon. But nine of that Atlantic salmon was actually rainbow trout. Two were Chinook salmon. So this is a Pacific species. Two were pink salmon. One was sockeye. These are all Pacific salmon. You cannot label those as salmon in Canada. And then one was a tuna. And here the DNA barcode couldn't tell if it was big eye or albacore tuna. Interesting. Now I'm not gonna take you through all 213 samples, but a couple highlights. There was one species, a student bought something labeled a sea eel. Now that's not even a legal label. You can label things eel and that's, or, or conjure eel um, for a different type of eel, but there is no such thing as sea eel according to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. So we were really, uh, intrigued to see what we'd get back. What we got back was a punctuated snake eel. It is a deep sea fish. It is not found anywhere in Canadian waters and it's not listed on the fish list. It cannot legally be sold in Canada. And here an undergrad student just happened upon it in a market in, I believe this was in 2016. Yeah, I think this one was 2016. Okay, so those are some of the highlights of the, the mislabeling, but there are some complexities. Those fish that we weren't quite sure, do we count that as mislabeling or not? If you go to a sushi store, you're, you're likely to see a label like this, hamachi, or uh, yeah, hamachi, um, which sometimes they'll have a little identifier off to the side. It usually does. They usually have a, a little interpretation because these sushi names are not legal labels in Canada. The CFIA does not recognize hamachi or unagi or ahi or any of these things as legal names. So you'll often find a little translation, yellowtail. Now, if you Google yellowtail, it's gonna come up as Japanese amberjack. And if you do a Google image search of yellowtail, you're gonna largely get Japanese amberjack. That's because everybody in the world understands that yellowtail is Japanese amberjack. If you eat hamachi, you're gonna get Japanese amberjack. That's just like the standard sushi thing, but not, uh, apparently, uh, according to the government of Canada, in Canada, yellowtail can apply to one and only one species of fish, and it is a flat fish, and it is not something you find in sushi. So that means just by default, every sushi vendor in the city is, is breaking the law, as it were. They're, they're doing exactly what you would expect under their cultural conventions, but the Canadian government doesn't recognize it as valid they recognize yellowtail as this flat fish and nobody else in the world does. It's really weird. And so when we got all of our hamachi, which was called yellowtail, virtually all of it, with I think one exception, was Japanese amberjack. That's not legal, that's technically mislabeling, but is that interesting mislabeling? As the consumer, I think most informed consumers of sushi would understand that they got exactly what they paid for in cases like this. Right? So under certain ways of, of saying things are mislabeled, you'd say 100% of hamachi is mislabeled, but um, it was exactly what you would think it should be. And there are other issues too, like ahi tuna. Every sushi connoisseur knows that's yellowfin tuna, but ahi is not a legal name under the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Uh, similarly, eel is the only acceptable name, but if you were to buy unagi, uh, they would often translate that as freshwater eel or dancing eel, which is not a legal term. But it still is American eel, which is what you'd expect it to be. Um, and then there are vendors who do things like, maybe they're trying to be helpful. They'll add, say, Pacific in front of the name of something, but that's not a legal name. Like Yellowtail Snapper is fine, but Pacific Yellowtail Snapper is not. So are these like wiggle room areas? It's not terribly interesting. When you eliminate the wiggle room, you end up with a much sort of better uh, state of things. Before we had one in three products mislabeled, but if we get rid of all the semantics, we have one in five. And you might ask, why on earth am I taking you through this? I'm taking you through this because it is this sort of stuff that's reported, not this sort of stuff. And in fact, Oceana um, specifically highlighted that Hamachi was one of the worst mislabeled products in Canada because it's Japanese amberjack and not this weird obscure flatfish. And they highlighted all these uh, concerns because Japanese, a Japanese amberjack can contain a toxin. If it's not um, handled properly, you could get sick. And so they were saying, you know, there's this sort of pandemic, uh, maybe that's the wrong word to use. There's this uh, uh, 
prevalence of dangerous fish on the market that are all mislabeled. Well, is it everyone who's eating uh, yellow, uh, hamachi knows that they're getting Japanese amberjack? Okay, so why does this matter? Well, I've hit one big reason, I think, and it's your health. There are fish that are dangerous, that can hurt you. Um, this particular uh, blogger, Scary Mommy, uh, talks about um, this, this was last, uh, I guess, back in 2018. This time she was poisoned at a barbecue. She just ate some fish at this barbecue. And it turned out to be a, 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 a fish within this group called the scombroids. And you can get what's called scombroid poisoning. It's, it's an allergic reaction that can be ex extremely scary and quite dangerous. So if you as the consumer buy something that's not a scombroid, but it turns out to be a scombroid, your health is at risk. Or uh, Escalar is often sold as white tuna. Now, white tuna is not a legal name. Uh, Escalar is not a tuna. You cannot use the term tuna for Escalar, but it's often sold under this name. And in fact, one of our students found Escalar on the market in Calgary under the wrong name. Escalar is called the Exlax fish because it produces a, a protein, or, or sorry, a fat that's difficult for us to digest and it can lead to significant indigestion. And if you're just wolfing this stuff down at an all you can eat buffet, it can land you in the hospital. It can be pretty serious. And of course, we know of certain species that accumulate mercury. Um, pregnant women aren't supposed to eat those uh, sorts of uh, species, right? So if you're eating the wrong thing without realizing it, it could put your health in jeopardy. It also affects your wallet. Cheaper fish typically get passed off as more expensive fish. Uh, as you see with uh, the red snapper and tilapia debacle, tilapia is often substantially cheaper than snapper. Um, but there's also conservation concerns. You may be eating the sort of pandas of the sea, as it were, without realizing it. You've done your due diligence, you got the fish that is doing well, and then you ate something that's actually protected. So in Calgary, our students um, purchased three Pacific salmon listed as secure. And all three, and the three of them were actually Atlantic, or sorry, Pacific cod, and, and they were actually Atlantic cod. So they were eating something that's considered imperiled without realizing it. We had one student purchase ahi tuna, which is listed as least concern, and it turned out to be Atlantic bluefin or Pacific bluefin. We couldn't tell which, but they ate an endangered species. Tell a student that they ate an endangered species, uh, and they tend to be devastated. It wasn't their fault. One that's uh, gotten quite a bit of interest in a, a paper just came out using our students' data on this was that we had two students purchase eel, which should be American eel, uh, eel sushi, and it turned out to be European eel. European eel is considered critically imperiled internationally, so it's on the verge of extinction, and it is not legally sold in Canada, yet two of our students found it. There's also this conservation concern, uh, particularly centered around red snapper, in that those two species of snapper, they're not doing terribly well in the wild, but go to any restaurant and it looks like they're doing great because they're everywhere. You can buy red snapper everywhere, yet none of it's red snapper. And so in the public mind, red snapper is doing just fine because you can eat it everywhere. But in actuality, you're eating a mislabeled product. Red snapper is not doing well, and it hampers conservation efforts because the public assumes that it's doing fine. So they're not gonna invest in that sort of conservation. So what can you do as an informed consumer? I would suggest, first of all, you can avoid legally ambiguous labels whenever you can. Remember in the Canadian Food Inspection Agency fish list, there are certain names that can be applied to multiple species. Well, when you run our data, Products that have a specific name on it, Pacific cod, Atlantic cod, uh, sockeye, salmon, those tend to be uh, exactly what you expected them to be. Mislabeling rates were very low, only about 10% of products that were um, specifically labeled were mislabeled. But if it was ambiguously labeled, that went up substantially. So if you buy something where you can't tell what exact species you just purchased, you're far more likely to be buying something that's mislabeled. But also these, this legally ambiguous labeling can cover over you know, um, conservation statuses. So if you buy something that has a specific label, it's far more likely to be a species of least concern 
than a species of conservation concern. But if you buy something that has an ambiguous label, it is far more likely to be something of conservation concern than something of least concern. So what we found in Calgary is that legally ambiguously labeled products were three times as likely to be mislabeled and five times as likely to harbor species of conservation concern. So avoid those labels, those ambiguous labels. If the label doesn't tell you exactly what species it is, try not to buy it. In fact, uh, you saw things called salmon, 39% of those were mislabeled. If it was called Atlantic salmon, 0% of them were mislabeled. Everything called Atlantic salmon that we bought was actually Atlantic salmon. And so encourage vendors to identify their products to the species level. I think what we're finding is that vendors who are uncomfortable with what they have appeal to that legal ambiguity in, in labeling with the hope that it will cover over whatever species they're actually looking at or, or trying to sell. So encourage vendors to identify their products to species. Third, purchase head on fish and learn how to identify them. Uh, it's much harder to be duped if you can see the entire fish in front of you. Be wary of fish that are cheaper than expected. You see some weird blowout sale on some fish that should be uh, quite expensive. Uh, there might be a reason. And of course, you can be engaged politically. You can write to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency or to local government officials to do, I'd say, one of two things. Uh, try to get them to change their practices around sushi. It just boggles my mind why they don't accept sushi naming conventions as legal. And it just exacerbates the mislabeling um, problem uh, needlessly. And secondly, support policies that enhance seafood traceability. And there are, are uh, uh, ways that this is happening now where you, could, you can actually find sort of a label that helps you know where that fish was caught, where that fish then went when it was caught, and you can track the whole history of that fish before it landed on your plate. And what we're finding in places like the EU is that mislabeling rates drop dramatically when you have enhanced seafood traceability. And finally, follow the labels. Um, things that are labeled with the MSC, the Marine Stewardship Council logo, or things like the OceanWise label, um, have been shown to be substantially less likely to be mislabeled than products that don't have those certifications. So, with all that said, I will uh, stop there and see if you have any, any questions. But thank you very much for your kind attention. Um, it was a real pleasure to share that work with you all. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Morris. That was a, an eye-opener for sure. Um, I guess I have one question off the top, I suppose, is are the retailers obligated to know exactly what fish they're dealing with, or are they just passing on that uh, thought to the uh, wholesaler or wherever they're getting their fish from? Yeah, John, that, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, because a lot of fish, something like 80% of the fish we eat in Canada is imported from elsewhere. Uh, it, it's not our sort of locally raised or, or homegrown species. Um, and so it's often, it's going through multiple sort of hands along the way before it gets to that grocery store or that restaurant. So the question is, who's, who's doing this, right? Is this happening uh, where they're, you know, they're processing the fish, uh, putting it into the little cans for tuna or whatever? Is it happening at the grocery store, at the restaurant? Um, and then who's culpable? So in terms of uh, culpability, uh, um, no, the, the vendor that's directly selling the stuff is culpable if they're the ones who are intentionally altering the label. But if they're just receiving it in good faith, they're not, they're not culpable for that. Uh, that said, some of the vendors in Calgary were uh, specifically uh, altering the labels. We, we heard stories while doing this work of people who would get a product that had red snapper labeled on one side and tilapia labeled on the other, and they ripped the, red, uh, the tilapia label off and they sell it as red snapper. So they knew what was going on. Um, I contacted a vendor who was selling things called salmon, but it was actually rainbow trout. Uh, and they told me that they knew exactly that they, 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 they were buying Norwegian raised rainbow trout from farms in Norway, and they were selling it as salmon. And their justification was that rainbow trout is more closely related to salmon than other trout are. And it was just sort of mind boggling that they would argue that um, they would be culpable. Uh, in the United States, there have been massive fines handed out to uh, distributors of, of uh, fish that were intentionally sending it off to the grocery stores in a mislabeled uh, state. 
Yeah, no, so that, that's a great question, John. Um, now, mm -hmm. what the Canadian Food Inspection Agency is doing right now is uh, there, there's been some new legislation uh, about enhanced traceability. I think it came into effect in late 2020. So we have data now before that, and we'll, we'll start collecting data for after that legislation to see if things change. But they're um, hitting the warehouses for the DNA barcoding to see if um, that's where the problem is rather than the grocery stores, because we get to it just pretty late in the process. Okay, so a couple of questions popped up in the chat there. Uh, one is, uh, does this mean anytime we order red snapper, we are actually getting tilapia? Yeah, so, uh, and this has been found not just in, in Calgary, this has been known for years, years across all of North America. Every city that they look in, uh, in the United States and Canada, when they sample red snapper, it is almost never red snapper. Uh, now, red snapper can be found in certain locations, uh, but odds are in Calgary, if you're buying red snapper, it is almost certainly tilapia or another type of snapper or rockfish. I'm just wondering, I remember going to the Calgary Zoo and going to the hippo pool, and they had these fish in the hippo pool to, to uh, eat the, uh, I guess, the poop. <laughs> yeah. the, uh, and I think those were tilapia. Those were tilapia. That's exactly right. Yeah. Oh, okay. So we could eat. We could be eating uh, hippo poo. Uh, <laughs> well, the, the the reason tilapia are are um, so popular right now is in part because they're relatively flavorless, so they don't offend. They don't have that sort of fishy taste that that other fish species have, um, and so you can do whatever you want with them when you're cooking. But also because in an aquaculture environment, they're extremely tolerant of low oxygen conditions. And they'll eat plants. And so they're, they're relatively cheap to raise. Like you can feed them on an algae diet rather than what you do with salmon, which is, you know, have to feed them a fish-based, uh, fish protein-based diet. So for all those farm salmon, right, they're feeding them other wild-caught fish that have been processed to then feed those farmed salmon. That's interesting. Uh, one question come up. Are there particular supermarkets or stores we should avoid buying fish at? Yeah, that's something that I actually have avoided uh, looking into, um, in part because of the culpability issue that these vendors, I don't think they need to be hit for something that they're not necessarily even aware is happening. Um, what I have seen is places like uh, Superstore have made a, a stronger commitment to um, uh, selling fish that have logos on them, like the Marine Stewardship Council logo. So they're trying to get options for for consumers that include sustainably harvested fish. They're selling a lot of head-on fish now. Um, and they've made uh, various commitments to uh, trying to act again. Now, this is not a commercial for Superstore. It's just something that I've, I've noticed in their fish sections. I don't attend Sobeys or Safeway as frequently to say if they're doing the same thing or not. But it's something, I, since I started this in 2016 um, or 2014, there's been a definite enhancement in, uh, in how they're selling their fish products. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Different questions are popping up now, which is great. Uh, what role does farm fish play in mislabeling? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, farmed salmon are genetically distinct from their wild counterparts, but not in a way that's resolvable using the DNA barcoding technique. So there's no way for us to uh, determine whether when it's called farmed, was it actually farmed Atlantic salmon or wild caught? So that didn't play any role in the mislabeling simply because we don't have the genetic resolution using DNA barcoding. Okay, um, when buying seafood products, for instance, shrimp, are there certain countries that are perhaps better to purchase from than checking the labels or when yeah. checking the labels? Yeah, that's, a, that's an ethically difficult question to answer because there, I mean, things are complicated, right? Uh, Canada, uh, the, the Atlantic coast of Canada has a thriving shrimp fishery right now that has been listed as uh, sustainable. And so if you find these, these products of Canada shrimp, uh, you can be fairly confident that it, it came from a, a good sort of healthy population. But the problem is that it's healthy because we overfished their predators to the brink of collapse. So we unsustainably harvested fish such that we now have a sustainably harvested shrimp fishery. <laughs> so there's, there's some issues there, right? Um, things like tiger prawns are a real problem. 
tiger prawns are, are often um, raised in, in Thailand or the surrounding areas, and they uh, require the destruction of vast mangrove forests in order to put in these little aquaculture places. Um, and that, that's a real issue. And the amount of fish that they feed these things to get them to grow is a real issue. And if you remember that Indonesian uh, tsunami that hit Christmas, however, Jesus, that over a decade ago now, um, they showed that the, the places that still had the mangrove swamps were buffered by that wave action. But the places where the mangroves had been destroyed had greater destruction and loss of human life. So things like that are ethically problematic, I think. But on the other hand, you know, it provides jobs and money. And so if you get rid of all that, what does that do to the livelihood of people in those countries is also a difficult question to answer. Okay, great. Um, uh, if you see, I guess one other thing I'd say is if you see farmed tuna, which is becoming a thing, um, know that none of that tuna is actually farmed. It's all wild caught juveniles that are then captured, placed in holding pens and raised until they're large. So they're not actually okay. raised in an, or, or born and hatched in an aquaculture setting. That sounds interesting. Um, can the tilapia be fed something to color the flesh pink? I have bought red snapper, which was rose colored. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm not sure if there's a dye that gets added or if there's some diet manipulation that goes on there. Because salmon, right, their flesh turns pink because of the carotenoids in their diet. And so all you have to do is feed these fish the correct sort of combination of carotenoids and, and their flesh can change color. I don't know if that's specifically happening to tilapia or not. Um, it's possible. I mean, it's weird that you would have, I don't think of tilapia as a terribly pink, or I don't think a red snapper rather is a terribly pink fleshy fish. So I'm not sure what that was, to be honest. Um, okay. Um, are mangrove swamp shrimp, like salva shrimp, healthy to consume? Um, that one, I... I couldn't tell you about, I'm sorry. I don't know anything about the, the health benefits of consuming shrimp. That's, uh, that's outside my wheelhouse, I'm afraid. Okay. One question I have, I, saw, I remember watching a program of some sort. So a company can catch fish, it seems to me anywhere in the world, they can process it someplace else. Yeah. But if the packaging or something is done in Canada, then it can be labeled as um, Canadian fish a, or something like that. Product of Canada, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah there's, right. It, it makes it tricky, doesn't it, to be able to, yeah. Um, but, but some packaging now will tell you um, where the fish was caught and the means by which it was caught. Uh, and, and that sort of information is really useful for making informed decisions. And there are um, fish sort of watchdogs like Sea Choice uh, that provide lists of ethically sourced fish, where if you know the location and you know the method of capture, um, you can see whether it's green, which is fine to eat, or yellow, is eh, maybe not as good, or red, like avoid at all costs. So products that have that extra information, you should vote with your wallet and go for that those sorts of products over products that just say product of Canada or product of Taiwan or what have you. So they would have some sort of lab, special label on the package indicating that it's so-called a green, a green fish. Yeah, it might. It, there could be a label that says that it is um, sustainably harvested, like that MSC label, or it might just say uh, caught by long line in the South Pacific or something like that. And then you can uh, sort of Google it to see if that particular type of capture and that particular location is okay for that particular species. Great. Okay, what did you say was the distinction between steelhead trout and rainbow trout? Oh, uh, steelhead are sea run trout, uh, whereas rainbow are freshwater. And that is a, kind of an interesting thing that you can purchase sort of farmed steelhead that have never seen the ocean. Um, so I'm not sure if those are genetically steelhead that they're raising in aquaculture. I suspect they're not. I suspect they're just regular old rainbow trout. Um, but legally, it doesn't matter. Legally in Canada, steelhead can refer to anything that's Oncorhynchus mycus. It doesn't matter about its, its uh, evolutionary history or its ecological niche. Oh, interesting. Um, what kind of enforcement happens in Canada? Like, who keeps track of all this stuff? Well, yeah, this is the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. This is their job. Um, and uh, they, they don't seem to hand out an awful lot of tickets. Like we've known 
it, it's not hard to figure out that tilapia and, and like undergraduate students are finding fish in Calgary that cannot legally be sold in Canada. And it wasn't difficult to do. Um, but the CFIA, I think, is understaffed. They took over a lot of the um, uh, purview of DFO when it came to like Department of Fisheries and Oceans, when it came to hatcheries management and, and those sorts of things um, and labs. And so they found themselves, I think, just in this world of enhanced responsibility, but decreased funding. And so um, there's not a lot of enforcement going on in Canada at the moment for this sort of stuff. And that's why this has been a persistent problem for years and years and years uh, where they typically hand out fines are things like, geez, was this in Quebec a couple of years ago where they found horse meat in the market um, being sold as, as beef. And uh, there was that uh, a crazy situation with sheep that they thought might have had foot and mouth disease in Ontario. And so they tried to kill them all. And then the people hid them so that they couldn't kill them because it was a unique genotype of sheep. And like, that's what CFIA was focused on. They have not done a whole lot for enforcing this fish stuff in Canada. Mm. So that's where you can write to them, right? Let them know yeah. that this matters. <laughs> right. Um, have you tested tin products? So when yeah, you're we, testing... we have, yeah, from the grocery store. Um, but the problem was that, uh, so the salt that you get in there um, is not great for DNA extraction and sequencing. And so we often didn't get any results back from canned products. So we would occasionally... Get, get something there was some recoverable dna from that that tissue uh but for the cost per sample it just wasn't worth doing so uh i think it was 2019 i just told the students i know it's cheap but stop buying the canned stuff because we'd get dna back for every like one in ten cans interesting stuff uh any other questions coming up here on the chat I don't see anything popping up at this time. So uh, with that in mind, I guess uh, I just would again like to thank you very much for uh, providing us with such a great talk.